Welcome to the Startup Competitors Podcast, where we talk with early stage entrepreneurs to understand what information they use to inform product roadmap, strategy, and market differentiation. Hey there. Today we're chatting with the founder and CEO of InsureMe, Sunny Patel. InsureMe is the maker of Violet. Violet is one of their solutions. It's the AI assistant built for insurance. Sunny and I go deep into Violet and everything that Violet does. We jump around quite a bit, which I think is good, mostly. I'm pretty happy with some of the places that we ended up. We talked a little bit about accelerators. We talked about data and kind of the future of data in the space that InsureMe is in. We talk a lot about uh, selling in a virtual world due to COVID. Got there accidentally, but I think that was actually one of the better parts of the conversation. Uh, Really enjoyed hearing Sunny's views on that. I really enjoyed this conversation. I hope you do as well. Uh, Please, if you like this episode, go find Sonny online. He provides a ton of different places to connect with him uh, afterwards and thank him for coming on the podcast. It would mean a lot to him. It's also a great way to help promote us and what we're doing here. Uh, So go do that and uh, please enjoy the episode. If you happen to be looking for a way to ignite your brand, spark some sales, or maybe just fire up your team, branded merchandise might be the way to do that. You can learn more about different items that are available to put your logo on at fuelmerchandise.com. It can be simple startup swag, corporate gifts, anything you're looking for. You can find it at fuelmerchandise.com. Mention startup competitors, get 10% off your first order. Welcome to the podcast. Today we have Sunny Patel, who is the founder and CEO of InsureMe. Sunny, welcome. Thanks for having me. Why don't we start with a quick pitch for InsureMe and what you and the team are doing? Yeah, so uh, my name is Sunny Patel. I'm the founder and chief executive officer at InsureMe. Um, We built a digital assistant named Violet that can help insurance carriers and agencies essentially reimagine their customer experience. So Violet can be customized for helping a, a user online go through the quoting process and buy a policy online. She can be customized for the first notice of loss uh, experience. So when a policyholder wants to file a claim, she can go ahead and walk them through that um, or any sort of frequently asked question or policy change that a policyholder may want to make. Uh, they can easily just hop online and chat with Violet and she can uh, take care of them from there. Awesome. And then hit us with a couple of quick uh, vanity metrics for the company. So somebody who's listening can get an idea of where you're at on this journey. It can be anything, number of conversations that have had, customers, uh, funding, revenue, whatever you're open to sharing, um, just to kind of paint a picture. Yeah. So we uh, launched in 2016. We've gone through three different accelerators, a global insurance accelerator, plug and play, um, and Coplex. We have raised 1.1 million in seed funding that has allowed us to uh, build our team of 12 based out of Phoenix, Arizona. And we have so far worked with a handful of carriers in the U.S., uh, namely two Fortune 500 carriers, Principal Financial Group and Farm Bureau Financial Services. Dude, that's a lot for just a handful of years. Congratulations. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks. I, I'm well, actually, I'm, I'm going to come back to the accelerators because I'd, I'd love to hear your experiences there. But before I do yeah. that, I will say somebody like super, super focused on insurance is insurance tech is pretty rare. So I got to ask, why did you start this company? Why insurance? Yeah, so it just by fluke, honestly, like I was a freshman in college and I got a part time job at an insurance agency uh, just down the road from ASU where I went to college. And um started doing a whole variety of things, you know, sales, operations, management, and saw that the way the industry was, was just completely outdated, not really consumer friendly. And so I thought that, you know what, this needs to be reimagined. And my summer of junior year uh, left that company and founded InsureMe. That's fantastic. And then, so that was 2016? That was 2016. Yeah. Summer of 2016. Nice. So then walk me through the accelerator experiences, which one was the, the first one that you went through? Uh, the, well, initially I partnered with Coplex, which is a uh, uh, accelerator here in Phoenix. And they essentially take you from idea to your MVP or revenue um, and then help you raise your seed round. So I partnered with them to kind of build out our initial MVP, 
put together the technical co-founding team and uh, then got applied to the Global Insurance Accelerator in Des Moines, Iowa. And I was part of that cohort in 2018. And that's kind of where we found uh, our kind of product market fit. We saw that, you know, what we had built was really impactful for insurance carriers and uh, a solution that they were really desperate for. So we went through that program, found product market fit there, and then went into plug and play in 2019 last year. Um, and I was part of the plug and play Silicon Valley insure tech batch, as well as the plug and play Singapore insure tech batch. So it was a, a whirlwind <laughs> worth of a you know year and a half. Why go through plug and play if if you feel like you had found product market fit before plug and play? What was the impetus to go through that program as well? Yeah, so plug and play is primarily a business development focused uh, accelerator. So it is usually you go to plug and play after you found product market fit, um, because all they really do is connect you with more customers, right? So they have about 100 plus different insurance carriers, both here at home and around the world, that they match you up with for deal flow. Um, so it really helped us have you know more conversations with more insurance companies. Awesome. When you think of competitors for InsureMe, who or what comes to mind? Um, so we compete against, you know, some other players in the market that have taken more of a, you know, generic uh, approach to conversational AI, right? So they're not a vertical specific vendor. Um, an example of, of that can be, you know, like uh, just like IBM's Watson. Pipestream is another company for enterprise level conversational AI. And then we we do have like one, I would say, you know, that is similar to us, Bixie out of the UK. But uh, the space is still fairly early and it's, it's, you know, still in development, I would say. So I think while there's other vendors out there trying to solve for maybe the same problem set, we're all taking a, a different approach. What makes conversational AI for insurance different or special? Is it the vocabulary being used, the types of problems that you're trying to solve, the, the backend systems that you're integrating with? Like when you think about what makes your space unique, what comes to mind? Yeah. So uh, insurance is, you know, one of the biggest industries in the world. When we think about our core technology, conversational AI, the lifeblood of it is data and insurance companies are huge treasure troves of, of data. So partnering with these carriers to kind of build out a conversational AI solution, we've seen that the technology as a whole can have such a tremendous impact to the organization because it is, you know, all these companies are very large. They have a whole variety of inquiries and different types of questions that they need to answer and interactions with their very large customer base. And the flexibility that conversational AI delivers for these type of companies is uh, truly remarkable. Walk me through where you get started with an insurance company, what, I guess, what is a, what is a typical customer engagement look like in terms of you've hopefully landed the kind of the, the, the first phase of that, of that contract yeah. is, are, are they coming in and saying, look, let's just focus on either, you know, where they feel playing. So is it just claims or is it just new customer applications or are, on day one, are you trying to kind of span across the organization yeah, no. So we definitely do focus on one use case first because we, the way we, you know, engage with our customers is that we do a pilot or a POC first um, and kind of prove out the technology and the ROI of of, of the actual solution um, for one use case, and then have a broader strategy to kind of roll it out across multiple other use cases. So it's it's definitely not you know we we do kind of go and reimagine the whole end to end customer experience on on day one. Uh, it's just not feasible. And we've seen that because this is all very new to our you know, target customers. We have to kind of also slow down for them you know, in a lot of ways. Because as a startup, we want to go and say, oh, well, let's go and fix all of these different areas of your company. But these are very, very big companies. you know, And trying to, it's almost like if you're trying to change course of a very large cruise ship, that just takes time. You know, it's not a speedboat like a, like a startup is. Yeah. I have some prior experience in insure tech. So I would imagine in the space that you're playing, if people are doing auto insurance, for example, you know, that, that 
can be different state by state. It can be different based on the types of policies that are being offered. How much of that complexity enters into your solution? So are you like when you think of rolling out within a larger client, are you doing those same type of, okay, we're going to start, we'll start with the pilot, then we're going to start rolling out these five states, and then we'll hit these seven states next. Is it that same thing? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it's it's very similar to like how they would do it even internally, right? Rolling out a new yep. product because it, it's all about risk, you know, the and if you think about it, insurance companies are all about risk. That's literally the business. So they're the they don't want to take too much risk and so they would prefer to pilot any type of, you know, new innovation that comes in on a much more smaller scale. So that could be it can be limited to the geography of where this solution is being marketed. Or available to only a uh, a certain you know pre vetted customer base, so it's definitely not just like rolled out on the homepage on on day one. So then, th- this may be a stupid question, but I I feel like this is something I would get frustrated with. So then, as a user, if I'm like I I can imagine a world where I'm using your solution to get updated quotes for my auto insurance. And then I'm like talking with Violet and I'm like, oh, hey, Violet, I have a motorcycle as well. Can you give me a quote for that? And then, of course, that hasn't been rolled out yet. How much do you see that where somebody's trying to jump into some other aspect of their insurance and, and you're just not quite there yet? And then I, I, I would imagine for me, that would lead me to be frustrated that I still now have to pick up the phone and talk to a human again. Right, right, right. So, I mean, for the pilots, we do tend to do, um, we try to limit how far the user can go, right? So we don't keep it very open-ended, like we would while, while it's rolled out at full production. So it's more guided experiences. You know, we use a lot of buttons and form, you know, clickable responses to kind of guide that user to a certain outcome. But in the, you know, the the, the broader value of the solution would be you know, like how you just explained where you're trying to buy one policy and then you want to buy another one and file can automatically do that. But in order for like, you know, the initial days of pilots, we we try to limit the scope of where that user can uh, end up, if that makes sense. Yeah. You're currently selling to individual insurance companies directly implementing the solution for them as a and this is this will be a question as opposed to being more of a like a quoting platform where somebody could just download violet start talking to violet and then violet would match them with the best insurance company that kind of fits their need that is that correct that's correct yeah so we um license out violet to the insurance carriers um and then we will be also launching Violet for agencies next month. So it's going to be not just insurance carriers, but also the agencies that sell policies for these carriers. Um, But by no means are we, you know, like a a brokerage or comparison site or service. Do you ever see yourself possibly going down that path? No. So we actually, funny enough, we started there, you know, so the (laughs) the initial idea for insureme.com was we built a a chat bot named Ari and Ari would walk you through a whole bunch of questions on buying a, for if you wanted to buy a term life insurance product. And then he would give you 12 different quotes from a couple of different uh, life insurance companies around the U S. But the thing is with, with that kind of direct to consumer approach, B2C, it's, it's just tough. You know, you have to raise a lot of money and it's a very crowded space as it is. So that's why we kind of took that B2B approach and we made that pivot. Um, and that actually happened during the Global Insurance Accelerator. When did you know you had product market fit? Um, I would say, you know, during the, towards the end of the Global Insurance Accelerator. And then once we joined Plug and Play, simply because of the demand and, and seeing that, you know, the, what we were solving for was a very real and pressing need um, of, of these insurance companies. So it was just, you know, general market feedback that we got, the traction that we were getting from a POC standpoint, and then even like some of the feedback we're getting from investors that were eager to invest in an AI first insure tech, you know, venture. Can I ask you to go one level deeper on that? Like, cause, cause I'm, I'm in particular, like I'm, I'm really curious about what it looks like or feels like when you know that you have product market fit. So like 
was there a day when when you just at, at the end of the day you were like holy crap we did it like it, it it's working people are paying for it like who who knew like what can you remember like a specific moment where you're like oh my goodness we've done it we have product market fit yeah i mean it, i don't think there was a, a specific day but i think when the product worked as intended i think that's when i in my mind i was like all right this is like the right solution you know what i mean because there was we got revenue before that and the the product wasn't working as intended, put it that way. You know what I mean? So like I, I saw that, okay, the, the demand for like, you know, a, a solution that's trying to solve for this specific problem set is there, but have we built the right solution, right? So I think only once Violet was able to successfully, you know, walk a customer through a sale end to end, and it, it essentially we've proved that she can, you know, deliver a very favorable ROI, that's when I saw that, okay, well, not only is the customer happy, but also the user is happy, right? The end user and the financials make sense. So that happened, I would say, you know, sometime end of last year. Got it. And what is the primary ROI that you're going after or even financial incentive, I guess, because it, it may not always be I'm guessing it could be very different depending on the client that you're working with. What are some of those things that they're trying to solve for from a business perspective when they turn to a solution like Violet? Yeah, uh, so it's a couple of different things, right? It would just depend on on the use case of Violet. Um, on the sales side, it's obviously like, you know, are we able to acquire customers at a more favorable customer acquisition cost compared to other channels um, and increased revenue enable them to capture more revenue. Um, on the claim side, it's more about reducing the cost to serve and the cost of claim and deliver, you know, a much more favorable claims experience. So we track kind of the the reduction in operation uh, operational costs as well as the increase in the kind of net promoter score on that claims experience. And then on the service side, it's, it's you know, we're tracking primary KPIs are, are you know, was this user able to actually complete their task or inquiry without having to go through another channel? So we quantify that and then just see if, if we're, you know, in all three cases, I think it's, are we increasing the overall net promoter score of that, of that company? Cause if we can deliver a great sales experience on the front end, that's wonderful. But if they fall short on, you know, some of the service aspect or even the claims process where really companies need to shine, then that's where I see a lot of, you know, companies go wrong. And we try to deliver a, a very cohesive and, and delightful customer experience with Violet. When you're building that business case to bring Violet into an organization, I have to imagine many of those things that you just listed off, I can see an internal IT team saying, well, look, we can do that. There's chatbot technology out there that we could just grab off the shelf. We know our data. We know how to, you know, we can figure out how to implement that stuff. Why go to a solution like Violet versus letting us try to build that internally? I, I have to imagine you come up against that all the time. Yeah, some, some t- I mean, initially we did, right? The buy versus build scenario. Yeah. And uh, frankly, you know, we can deliver. I always say, if you're that confident, go ahead, right? But they never do because it doesn't make sense you usually they'd have to go and get like hire a whole bunch of nlp people you know to even figure out how to replicate the solution Um, we've seen that they don't have the time for it you know and it's not a priority out of the million different things that an internal it team can be working on at a carrier it ain't this unfortunately you know and fortunately uh so we you know the way we position our solution is that we can deliver a much quicker, you know, time to benefit for the customer so they can start to generate, you know, that ROI and the value out of the solution without having to go and figure, you know, take months or years to get a solution uh, that was built in-house off the ground. That is the, I would say, you know, kind of the, the primary thing that we, you know, we, we kind of articulate if we do ever get that, well, we can just try to replicate it in-house. Got it. Great answer. This episode is brought to you by Full Stack PEO. Most founders start companies because they figured out a better way to solve a problem or serve a need, not because they love tracking payroll, filling out compliance forms, and explaining employee benefits packages. And yet, all that stuff still has to be done. 
That's why there's Full Stack PEO. Full Stack PEO specializes in turnkey HR for emerging companies, not just those core services, but advice and expertise that help founders maximize employee potential. Curious? Find out more at fullstackpeo.com. Fast forward, let's go five years into the future. What does InsureMe look like five years from now? Yeah, so uh, positioning ourselves to be kind of the leader in our segment, right? So we do want to remain vertical specific. We are the, you know, kind of digital assistant for insurance. We want to make sure that we are building Violet to be, you know, the smartest, if you will, in the space. So we're continuously, you know, delivering the most value for the customers that have chosen to leverage Violet. I think in five years, I do want to you know, if you think about insurance, there's the insurance carriers, then there's agencies, and then there's agents, you know, as well. So there are far more kind of stakeholders we can apply Violet to and, and you know, drive value to with Violet. I see us expanding into some of those other, do you want to call it customer segments in the insurance vertical, and then also scaling into other territories around the world. So not just being a U.S. domestic company, but also servicing insurers in uh, Asia, Europe, South America, Africa, and Australia as well. And I I neglected to ask this earlier, and it just occurred to me, I've been assuming all along it's primarily focused on like property and casualty, but are, are you also doing like life insurance, health insurance? Yep. Is it everything in insurance? Everything, yeah. So we're product line agnostic. So bio can be customized for just about anything you, you'd want, right? That's a uh, magic of conversational AI, but we have not put her into a box and said, well, this is just a, you know, a solution for PNC companies or life health and annuity. It's for everyone. That's what we work with the, with the companies on, you know, figuring what those best use cases are. We're internally, we're building out, you know, our uh, domain specific or product specific data sets. So for example, you know, that's another value add here of working with us compared to building it in-house is that the customers are getting the the value um, of our data set that's learning from everybody at one time. So they don't, they're not having to rely on their own data set and then train the AI over 10 years to figure out how to answer, you know, one specific question. So that is another one of the big value adds of why partner with InsureMe and Leverage Violet compared to, you know, trying to replicate it in-house. What are, if you can talk about this, what are some of the challenges that you've dealt with over the last kind of four years in fi- figuring out and understanding those data sets? So I, I can imagine what you just said would make it very hard for an in-house team to do. Also, is what makes it hard for you to do. Mm-hmm. What What are maybe some of those kind of false starts, breakthroughs that you've seen over the years that have kind of gotten you to where you're at, just specifically from like a data science and uh, technology perspective? So one thing we did fairly early on was, again, partner. And I have to give a lot of credit to the GIA for helping us really find partners to train Violet, right? So this can be uh, agencies or and or uh, carriers that we work with to really understand, you know, dive deep into like what are their customer inquiries coming in, like to the call center and other channels And then helping, you know, which essentially helped us guide our strategy of really building out our data set. So focusing on like, you know, what what are the top 100 questions that a life insurance company would get when a customer is filing a claim, right? So we we approached um, a whole variety of, of companies that we've done internal POCs with and leveraged the their kind of IP, you know, to train, to train Violet. That's kind of a one way we did it. Another way was uh, just talking with a lot of people. I mean, we've kind of put this together <laughs> with uh, input of, of just actual stakeholders. So um, these are the claims processors or agents that are selling policies and really building out, you know, as many possible inquiries and intents that we, we, we could think of. And then relying also on the the, the feedback and, and inquiries that are coming in from the live instances of Violet that, that are out there. Um, but that, that's something that, you know, you just have to wait over time and people will ask a certain question. Then you have to go and go in and tag the appropriate intent and the response. Uh, and that's something that, you know, has been just building and growing as kind of a, 
a spider, like almost like a spider web over the past four years. But it's it's been a whole variety of things. I put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I can nothing imagine. Too, nothing too like you know sophisticated either. It's just like, uh, and that's how it's supposed to be, right? In the early days of startup, you kind of have to get creative of, of how you put the the thing together. And then um, now we're going to be investing in, in some more you know sophisticated technology that can help um, get us to more accurate replies quicker and partnering with other, you know, data providers that are out there. But obviously, you know, that all costs money. And in the early days when you are starting off, you know, especially before we got funding or anything like that or revenue, uh, you better kind of do it the old fashioned way. Yeah, understood. Long term, I would imagine that data outside of just understanding how to create a better customer experience for insurance carriers and, and agents and everybody else in the value stream, there's got to be other implications for that data long-term, right? I mean, I would imagine you're going to be building a data set that if five, 10 years from now, you're going to be able to monetize in other ways as well. Correct. I mean, do you guys view That's it that right. way? Is that part of what you're part of the long game as well? It's part of the long game. You know, it's definitely not part of the, like the now and urgent, right? Cause we're trying to yeah. really figure out the, the, the actual, you know, customer experience. But then, I mean, the system is, you know, recording everything. Um, it's just going to be like, okay, well, how do we read that? You know, all the, I don't know how many billions lines of code that's going to be there in five years, but how do you read that data and provide, you know, actionable insights to, you know, one hour of customers that leverage Violet, but also other potential partners in the future. But the, you know, the data strategy as a whole was one of the primary reasons I think we were able to raise our last round of funding and kind of got that hype built up around the company. Awesome. All right. Uh, so switch gears with me here for a minute. What are you into right now personally in terms of uh, new skills, hobbies? Uh, if I peeked in on your life on a Saturday morning, what would I see you doing, learning, getting better at? Yeah, uh, well, so there's like, you know, not much we can do right now, but uh, I'm at home, <laughs> you know, which is kind of different than normally because before I was just literally on the go all the time. Like I, I spent the majority of my time in an airplane or a hotel or an Airbnb. And, and, and that so was now, all sales related? For the most part, yeah. I mean, sales, uh, conferences, I spoke at conferences. Uh, uh, I was just having a great time and <laughs> that just got shut down so fast. And that's fine. You know, that's, it's just what we have to deal with. But I have been, you know, with my time now at home, figuring out, you know, like how to be better at, at sales one, right. But remote, uh, whereas before it was all in person and I kind of built a, a good way of working a room, if you will, like in person, but I was yep. never really good at it via a, a Zoom call or anything like that. So I've been trying to figure out how do you you know, still be a kind of a charismatic person or a leader or a salesperson, whatever that may be, through Zoom. Also, being a little bit more introspective, I think it's because I've, I've you know, energetically have come to, a, it's like the universe has put me at a halt. You know, I'm able to kind of be with my thoughts more. And, you know, you, once you're like pulled out of that fast life, just becoming more introspective and seeing like the why behind me. So I, I feel like I've been psychoanalyzing, you know, myself and, and why, I, the, why I'm the way I am or the, why do I make the decisions that I make and things like that. Right. And I think introspection is kind of the first step, you know, towards becoming a better person or growing as a leader. So I've been um, just kind of thinking about that more, you know, while being at home. And seeing how I can, once the world does kind of reopen and we're back to the fast life, how can I be a more effective business person, leader, son, you know what I mean? Like just in friend in, in all different types of ways. So I'm, I'm super curious, what are some of the resources you've been leaning into to, to try to figure that out? Uh, any particular books, blogs, podcasts, uh, any content that you've kind of been digging into that you found particularly helpful for how to sell remote, lead remote, do, do everything remote? 
Yeah. Um, for me, you know, it's a lot of the way I've learned in general, you know, um, or learn is just I like to do it, you know, so I just have more meetings. I just I like kind of fill my calendar up with uh, different, different uh, meetings. And I, I've just learned by practicing, right? So practice makes perfect, I guess, on at least, you know, how do you become a better presenter on Zoom or, or running a meeting remotely? So I've just done it by having more meetings. And then uh, in terms of like leadership or stuff I've been reading, I have been reading uh, this book called Entrepreneurial Leadership by Joel Peterson, who was uh, the former chairman of JetBlue. And it's uh, all about like how essentially, you know, whether you're a startup founder or if you're in the, let's say you're a Navy SEAL or whatever that may be, right? If you're in any sort of leadership position, how you've got to kind of possess a, a variety of traits and how those traits kind of grow as you grow as a person. So I'm, I'm only like halfway through it. I'm not fully, you know, finished with the book, but I found a lot of value from that because I can, you know, Joel, the author, gives a lot of examples from his own life, as well as there's a lot of viewpoints of or examples of other people and how they approach problems in their journeys to becoming entrepreneurial leaders. Because an, uh, an entrepreneurial leader is kind of different than, you know, a general leader. They kind of have to wear a lot of hats and have a lot of skills that they need to really strategically apply during different phases of their life or their company. You know, I've related to that book more than anything else that I've read recently because I feel like I'm in the game, you know, right now. Nice. I like the idea of uh, of just like my words, not yours. To, the way that you get your 10,000 hours is to just book more hours <laughs> in terms yeah. of just getting the experience. <laughs> so where do you like, are those are those sales meetings? So you're just doubling down your outreach to book sales meetings now? You're doing that with the team? Like where are you finding the opportunities to to do that kind of presenting, speaking, uh, selling during during COVID? Yeah, so it's uh it's a mixture of just about everything, right? So sales, um, internal meetings with our team. Uh a lot of it actually, and I'm just looking at my calendar it is a lot of feedback you know meeting so i'm speaking with mentors you know a lot of mentors that um, i have for the company and then even personally on you know our approach because we've made you know a couple different changes at the company so i'm using this time to really speak to people that i would not normally if that makes sense you know because i know you know kind of yeah. where everybody's at home right now and everybody kind of has availability. I'm utilizing that and taking advantage of that time because also, you know, when everything does tend to reopen and we, we become more busy with our lives, I think um, they're going to become more busy as well. So I'm, I'm utilizing this time to fill up my calendar with meetings with uh, insurance executives, other founders that have built, you know, bigger successful companies and just getting their feedback on, on kind of our next, you know, couple steps. So I'm curious with that being said, do you think when we do reopen, you'll travel as much as you did in the past? And if you do, will you miss the, the fact that you've had these types of opportunities to connect with folks because you're not traveling? Yeah. So that's what I wonder, you know, it's like, because I, I think that there's going to, I just don't think we're going to go back to the way it was because if you think about it, we've had a good, well, whatever it's been, right, four or five months of yeah. really getting comfortable with the remote life and Zoom and all that. So, and it is efficient. So, I don't think you know, like even the bigger companies are going to be sending their teams flying all over the place, you know, spending a whole bunch of money anymore after even once we do reopen. So, I, I, I don't know. This will date this podcast a little bit, but today uh, Google just announced that they're going to be 100% remote through July of next year. So a, a whole other oh, wow. year, uh, which is, I mean, it's Google, right? So I'm, I'm sure, you know, most of their employees can work remote, but but even just saying, just coming out right out and saying like, yeah, we're just, <laughs> we're done with offices for a whole other year. 
and until we see how this all plays out. I mean, it is going to be super interesting when you think about like, will I even have somewhere to fly to when, yeah. when I'm ready to travel? Will they want me there? That's the thing. You know, I, I don't maybe it definitely might not be for work anymore. You know, before I had the luxury of there was always an excuse to go somewhere. You know what I mean? Like there's a conference, it's this, there's a customer meeting. Yeah. And then I would make it into like a, a holiday as well. You know, just stay another couple of days and explore the the place. But now I, you know, I've been somebody that has been traveling ever since I was born, you know, like all over the world. And I'm just used to being on a plane and in airports and all of that. And when that gets taken away so abruptly, I think it's going to be, that's like one of the hardest things I think I've found this whole time is just trying to be in one place, you know, and, and not be bouncing all over the, the world. But I'll definitely still travel for fun you know hopefully there's that uh that reason too yeah i used to travel well i guess it would go in spurts but but i would travel a fair amount throughout the year and i loved it as well uh i like going to new places i like eating crazy food i i like meeting new people uh so it, it's very much uh something that i kind of now that i don't have you know i complain about it when i did it but now that it's gone i'm kind of like oh i i kind of want to go to a conference or something i i want to get right, out and, exactly. <laughs> and see people and do things yeah, yeah exactly you never thought you'd you say at. that you know what i mean like i don't i want to go to a, a like even i say like i want to go to an short tech conference like i mean like uh, yeah i never thought those words would come out of my mouth but i do miss it now you know all of those different things so I was I was talking to somebody here in uh, just this morning um, in a one on one. I was talking to somebody on our team about kind of sales in a COVID world, and you know one of the things that that we were talking about was the challenge of you know even if you do attend a digital event, there's no like it's not networking like you would typically have, right? I can't just grab exactly. you by the sleeve yeah. and pull you off to the side and be like, oh, no. hey, Sonny, tell tell me more about what you do. Like, exactly. so how? When you're in those events, how do you how do you make the most of them or or based on some of the research and reading you've been doing, how do you think you will make more of them in the future? I think you know what I've done is um people that I do want is because like I, I'll agree with you, the magic all happens at the after party or at the cocktail. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's not at the the fireside chat, you know, where basically half the people are asleep. It's uh, it's usually done at like the the party or like the after party where you're having drinks with people. And then that's where like the DL or the relationship is formed. And now with without that, like I, I just kind of go to the guest list and I'll see like, all right, this is somebody I actually I do want to like, you know, talk with one on one. And then I will reach out to them and schedule a, a time for a like a half an hour call with them just one on one. But yeah, I mean, I don't think they're, they've figured out a way to to kind of replicate that because that's the the magic of in person. That's the magic of being social. Like, and you can't really do that online. Quick, quick strategy and tactics. So you're reaching out to them to to say, hey, let's let's grab 15, 30 minutes chat one on one. Are you doing that in in Zoom? Are you doing that in LinkedIn? Are you doing that in email afterwards? How when are you doing that? Definitely like after I do it uh, via email or LinkedIn, you know, LinkedIn actually works pretty well for me. They do tend to, you know, respond like if I, if I just slide into their DMs and then I just <laughs> say like, Oh, Hey, you know, like I, if, if this is a, a normal conference, I'd buy you a drink, but here we are, you know, <laughs> oh, nice. we, we can just do a virtual happy hour and make a, a cocktail over Zoom. Okay, so, that so that's that's pretty well played. So you're still doing it really timely. So the you know the event, the networking event wraps up, and and you're finding the two or three people you wanted to connect with and hitting them right away. Yeah, exactly. You know, so because yeah, it's just like anything, right? Any sale or whatever, you got to do it while while the lead or whatever is hot and top of mind. So yeah, that's kind of and it's a lot of experimenting. You know, I'll, I'll try out different like what you know like the first line i guess or the or whatever you you start off your paragraph with so i try out different different things and see what gets a better response but i think keeping it real keeping it conversational um just like how you would if you were at the bar you know what i mean like people tend to respond well with that 
I don't I don't keep a lot of my messages very formal, but that just might be my style. <laughs> no, I uh, I love it. I think it's great. And I, I mean, I would be much, much more likely to respond to somebody who hit me up right away. They did it in four, yeah. just like they would at the event. Like th- there's zero chance I'm not replying to that person, even if it's to just say, hey, can't right now. Can Let's chat right. next week. Exactly. Um, yeah, that's great. I love it. All right. Well, I've probably kept you entirely too long. Uh, thank you for that digression. That was awesome. I really enjoyed that. I never thought the podcast would get to uh, to, to pick up lines on LinkedIn, but I'm, gl- I'm glad we got That's, there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, Sonny. If uh, people want to learn more about InsureMe, what's the best way for them to do that? Or if, if they want to get in touch with you, where is the best place for them to do that? Yeah. So to learn more about InsureMe or Violet, uh, it's just our website, you know, insureme.com and that's spelled i-n-s-u-r-m-i.com um, and then if you want to reach out to me i'm available uh, and easily reachable on linkedin so it's just linkedin.com slash sunny patel 94 uh or instagram you know <laughs> again slide into the dms uh, sunny patel 94 <laughs> and that's like i'll just be real with you You're like that's like the easiest way to get in touch with me you know because email like i will get 150 a day you know so it can take some time but a quicker way is just linkedin or or instagram (laughs) i can certainly appreciate that all right sunny thank you so much for taking the time i truly appreciate it thanks a lot i really enjoyed this uh this podcast if you're thinking of launching a SaaS product Startup competitors can provide data on your closest competitors, survey potential users, or provide other product validation services. Learn more at startupcompetitors.com.